Welcome to Beyond Galileo, a program involving a series of podcasts that explore subjects and ideas surrounding the current exhibition at the University of Oklahoma's Fred Jones Jr. Museum of Art, titled Galileo's World, an Artful Observation of the Cosmos. I'm Gary Gress, a member of the Department of Geography and Environmental Sustainability in the College of Atmospheric and Geographic Sciences, and I will be your host today. Each of our podcasts will have artful conversations with experts in their fields from the Norman OU campus to find out how their disciplines, including art, science, philosophy, and many more, bridge Galileo's world to our own. Today, our featured guest is Heather Atone. Heather is currently the James T. Bialock Associate Curator of Native American and Non-Western Art at the Fred Jones Jr. Museum of Art. The primary focus of her research and writing has been to examine the intersection between contemporary indigenous art and traditional tribal knowledge and cultures. She is a member of the Chickasaw Nation and has strong family ties to the Choctaw and Kiowa communities. Hi, Heather. Hello. How are you? First off, Heather, as far as the exhibit is concerned, how does Native American art fit into an exhibition that addresses Galileo? Well, thank you for that question. Sure. And um, thank you so much for having me here today to visit about this. Um, for me, as someone who's researching Native American cultures um, as uh, related to how they're expressed into contemporary art, um, the tie to astronomy is a very evident and important relationship. I mean, often p when people think of Galileo, um, he's often referred to as the father of the obser observational astronomy. And a lot of the work that he did in uh, the 16th century is, has been critical to the ad advancement of astronomy. And of course, you know, there's so much that's um, considered uh, primary knowledge that comes through the Western science paradigm, but all science is culturally driven. And in the indigenous communities here in the Americas, there are strong bodies of science um, and including astronomy. And so um, I was happy to be and very honored to suggest some objects that might be included in the exhibition to help share that information with our audiences. Yeah, I know um, we've got a couple here that you're, I know, interested in. Speaking, you mentioned paradigm. Uh, is there a single astronomical paradigm for the continent, you know, let's say Greco-Roman versus Native American uh, perspectives? Well, of course, Native American is actually a racial construct. It's not a cultural construct. So it's really important to keep in mind that when you're thinking of the race of Native Americans, it includes 566 federally recognized tribes and many tribal communities beyond that that don't have federal recognition. But of all of those groups, there are relationships, and those relationships go back to our creation. There are eight creation stories that have been documented in the North American continent, and I'm going to focus my comments to the North American continent, even though my research is indigenous and extends into the South America, that the... Um, for the purposes of this, I think it's important not to be too large. And so there are eight cosmological stories of Genesis that occur on this continent. And within those eight, then you start to have them carried through different tribal communities across the continent. Those tribal communities have shifted across time. Um, that knowledge is known to go back into the prehistoric period. We know that because of their presence on cave drawings. We, we see constellations being referred to in some of the imagery that goes back to the very earliest presence on this continent, which goes back, if I'm not mistaken, at least, um, at least 15,000 years. We know that just from the bison skull that's held in the um, Sam Noble Museum's collection, that even in this place in Oklahoma, there were people back 15,000 years. So this is very ancient knowledge, and it's um, that relationship between the Earth and stars um, has different iterations. And within each of those eight Genesis stories, there are different constellations that are coded to each of those paradigms in North America. You know, you mentioned uh, there's a couple of works that you have identified with. I know one of them was uh, the Tony Day Code uh, in the uh, San Ildefonso Pueblo astronomy, um, I think it was a canvas, if I'm not mistaken, Faces of the Moon. It's a watercolor, a so water I think color. it's probably okay. on paper or um, a board, art board. It was the White Horse one, I think, that was the canvas one. But yeah, yeah, mm. okay. Would you elaborate a little bit on uh, Tony Day 
and uh, that particular work of art. This is something that was made in 1964. So, um, you know, for many people on this canvas, that's within our own lifetimes that this object is relevant. But the knowledge that it represents, um, and Tony Day was a member of the of Maria Martinez's family, and he was um, incredibly innovative in his abstraction, use of abstraction, but also um, that use of abstraction really extends from a tradition within the tribal cultures to encode the knowledge into designs and motifs that people recognize, but they may not have the knowledge to understand what that coding is representing. In the painting that's in the exhibition titled Many Faces of the Moon, there are 18 moon faces that overlap, and I think in a way that he is playing on the relationship that this knowledge has across time. Things can shift, the face of the moon shifts, but the stars remain, and this is why the stars have been so critical. Around the very organized and sort of geometrically um, based composition, um, there is a border of two sacred holy people that wind around. If you look really closely, there's uh, two faces and their bodies are extended into these lines that almost look like Art Nouveau type um, decoration, but those bodies wrap around and actually create the four corners of the earth. And around the four corners of the earth, then Tony Day has surrounded that on the outer edge, has created a frame, and that frame are the uh, 12 uh, most important of the constellations to the San Ildefonso Pueblo people. That visual itself, um, I'd, I'd like to talk about uh, what is already encoded in tribal stories. Uh, you just mentioned, uh, you know, some some really good reference points as far as talking points, but give us an idea of tribal stories and what is already there as far as uh, the celestial, if you will, historic slash history of tribal origins, if you will. Well, um, as I mentioned. Um, you know, in my readings that there are these eight separate stories and there are varieties. Each tribe has their own version of their relationship to that story. And of course, the cosmology includes the stars as part of those stories. Um, we have tribes here in Oklahoma, of course, with the diversity that we have in our state. We have uh, multiples of those eight represented in, in this community. But I want to maybe take a leap here, if you don't mind, yeah, yeah, and talk because, about the Navajo story, because that sure. would be um, perhaps, I think, helpful to the people who come to look at Emmy Whitehorse's painting. Sure, that's and good. I, and yeah. I have to say, like, I don't know the whole of the San Ildefonso Pueblo um, constellations, right. but I'm more familiar with um, the Navajo stories. And so, well, um, I, w I was what I was you're, you're doing great, because I was trying to get in a roundabout way, you know, these stereotypes that right. folks have. Yeah, like there's just yeah. one way to look at the stars. Yeah, no kidding. Yeah. Well, we're all looking at the stars, right? I mean, any of, right. well, unless you live in New York City or someplace that's so bright that you just have all that light pollution. But here in Oklahoma, I mean, they're just about everywhere you live, you can see the stars. I mean, I live just a mile from campus, and I can see the stars as they're rising through, even with the canopy of trees that sort of lifts up the horizon line. So let's think about the Navajo stories. The Navajo stories believe that there was um, levels of emergence, and we're currently living in the fourth world. The constellations have helped guide the people through those various emergence stories, and in the place of the fourth world that the Navajo people live now, Changing Woman, who was the sort of deity that helped to create the Navajo people. Before the Navajo people, there were other kinds of beings. And one of those is encoded into the stars, and that's just one. And I'm just using one example because it's, I think, a point where people can connect. And it, she's uh, First Woman, and First Woman is encoded into the uh, constellation that, uh, I believe it's a Roman um, constellation of Cassiopeia. And Cassiopeia is a series of stars that make sort of a zigzag line if you were to look at them in the sky. And whenever you see that in the rotation of that constellation as it passes through the sky um, is directly related to the story of first woman. There's also a story for first man, the hunters, the gatherers. There are other stories. And these stars are the same stars everybody sees all over the planet globally, right? We're all looking at them, but they have different stories encoded to them. And I mentioned Cassiopeia because I think that in the work that uh, Emmy Whitehorse made in the planetarium um, painting, there are these zigzags that repeat throughout the, the, um, the image. And her painting, to me, um, the relationship between uh, star and constellation positions very much guides the agricultural lifeways of the Navajo people. And so even though you could look at it and say, oh, planetarium, she's got all these like floral motifs, 
she's not misunderstanding the word planetarium because there are also constellation references in there. And I believe that Cassiopeia is one of those. And so um, that relationship between the stars and um, traditional life ways, the hunting cycles are guided by the stars, the ceremonial events all over the continent. This is how our uh, indigenous people have organized their world. And we believe that the stars are relatives of ours, that they are an extension of us um, as human beings. And it helps to keep us in balance in our sense of our relationship to the earth as well. So we know that the earth is more than us. We know that it's one of those stars. Heather, can you explain some of the designs or motif in the White Horse work? Uh, for example, uh, the shape that looks a little like a spiral or, or some sort of tendril. Can, can you explain that a little bit? So the mark that we were looking at, and it repeats across Emmy's painting, to people who come up and look at it, it's going to look like a, I would say it looks a lot like a, a shepherd's crook. Ah, that's a good right? way. Yeah. Like it's a, it has a rotated top, but it extends into a straight line. So a lot of people are going to, you know, Mary had a little lamb. What is yeah. she carrying? She's carrying a shepherd's crook. You described crook. it a whole lot better than I just but did. <laughs> in the Navajo community and many of the communities in the Southwest, that particular design actually references the emergence of a bean plant. And so it's often referred to as a bean sprout. If you were to look at that and then look at like Hopi kachinas, you're going to see the same kind of mark on their cheeks. And it's relating to that emergence of this new life. And those plants are the actual process of like when should the seeds be put down. All of that is guided by the constellations. Amazing. So how important is, um, and I know you've already mentioned this, but uh, let's go and say how important is uh, astronomical sightings as far as in Native American art? And how important would that be to uh, possibly have people really start thinking along those lines as far as Native American art? I know that uh, some of the very popular exhibits in this particular uh, museum happen to be the Pueblo art and the, you know, those traditional, if you will, um, Pueblo shots, American Southwest shots, and things of that nature. And uh, for me, uh, you've really helped me expand on uh, talking about art because that's what art is all about, you know, talking, conversing, and thinking, and, and asking questions about it. And uh, so th this importance of astronomical uh, sightings, if you will, and constellations to art is uh, you really, you've sort of opened up in a whole new, uh, you know, realm for me at least. And uh, any any other ideas or comments on that? Well, I mean, I think generally one of the things that has been um, maybe an impediment to the incorporation of Native Americans within the sciences, this is an issue that um, I feel very strongly about. I mean, there's less than one-tenth of one percent in the sciences as professionals are Native American. That's not even relevant to our population um, statistics, which were at least three percent of the population. Um, and one of the problems is is that because culturally part of your identity comes out of your knowledge of, um, you know, your Genesis story, where is what is your tribal history, all of those kinds of things. You know, generally science is recognized as a Western dominant field. That's a Western cultural dominant field, not just like Western as a normalized you know, but even the way science works right now is guided by a particular Western cultural perspective. That cultural perspective does not see the earth as a living being. It doesn't see the stars as having any relationship to the earth except in this cosmological relationship. Um, for Native people, that's a very difficult thing to constantly be in a field where you're being combated and who you are. Um, and, you know, just even the fact that English is considered the language of science, you know, this is a dominant colonialized language. There's a lot of that that is, you know, a, a forms of cultural oppression. And within a field that has been grown within that cultural paradigm, it's very difficult to engage. However, our Native communities have had longstanding, valuable knowledge that continues to thrive. And there are people in um, the United States who come from tribal communities who have made significant contributions to the sciences. I mean, Al Koyawema is one who comes to mind. He's a former NASA physicist. Fred Begay, also a NASA physicist. Um, these people were the most astute in understanding their relationship to their own cultural identity and able to bridge that and make contributions into what we think of what is the preeminent institution in this country for knowledge about the stars. And they're working in these places. 
Um, it's just really important for people to understand that our cultures have so much rich knowledge that we have worked through difficult and arduous times, but continue to hold that knowledge. And we continue to hold it in trust for future generations. And, you know, my own experience with STARS is I can remember sitting in the car with my grandpa or out at camp out in, you know, southwestern Oklahoma, and there's nothing to do because all you can see is the stars. There's no TV and you're just <laughs> hanging out. And hearing these stories about the stars, um, it is a very personal relationship to the environment. It's a very personal relationship that extends into the cosmology um, and into the cosmos as a result of that. And so um, trying to understand Native American art, it's really critical for people to recognize that all of that ceremonial knowledge, what we call the sciences, you know, all of these things are informing what these artists are producing. And I guess for the community members, for the artists, it's not important for them, for someone outside their community, for these Pueblo artists, for Tony Day, I don't think it would be important to him whether I understood it because I'm not from San Aldefonso Pueblo. But it is important to me as a curator of Native American art to help people to come to understand that when these images just look very sort of, you know, what did you call it, glimpses into the Southwest landscape, yeah, it, that they are coded yeah. with rich knowledge. You have such a wonderful perspective uh, today and, and these observations of yours, uh, it's, it's really, to me, very enlightening. And uh, we really appreciate you uh, for being part of this uh, podcast series. Our guest today was uh, Heather Atone. And Heather, thank you so much for thank being with so us. Thank you so much. I appreciate this sure. opportunity. 